Morena, Adriana, Christine, how are you? I am very good. How are you? How's your day been? Good, good. Welcome to New Zealand World News uh, for the positive approach that we have taken the initiative to have a conversation with people like yourself who are having a very, very high drive to make this Aotearoa a better place. Now, um, as I would like all the viewers and listeners to introduce Adriana Christie as one of the most talented person that I have come across, multi-talented, I can say, and who has got a drive to change, to make a positive change in Aotearoa with her visions and her skills. However, today we are gonna talk about all about future-proofing of our nation. And so we have got a few topics that uh, we would like to have your visions on your personal views and not just on what you are attached to political parties and there are different political parties who has got different views, but we are here today to see what Adriana visions are for some of the crisis that we are facing in today's um, world. So this is all related to our country and our nation, Aotearoa, which is a beautiful place. And we would like people like Adriana to come here and make it more beautiful. So over to Adriana. Um, uh, we would like to start with one of the, um, one of the things we would like to start is let, let me just uh, introduce, I have introduced Adriana, but let me see, she is also an elected member of the Auckland Council Waitamata Local Board. And she has seen firsthand, and this is her second time, I believe, that you are in. And so you have already seen the groundwork and the differences that you know, or the challenges that you have. So I am absolutely delighted to talk to you for a person like you who has already experienced that. So over to Adriana. Tell me something about you and out to our viewers, and then I can get into the questions. Um, kia ora. I'm very grateful for being here. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am half Colombian, half Kiwi. I was born in South America in Colombia, and my mother is a Kiwi, a Pakiha. And um, I moved over to Aotearoa when I was 17. Mm. Um, I've always been passionate since very young about um, implementing sustainable business practices into retail hospitality and corporates in terms of being able to create a aggregated value that isn't just from generating revenue. So the environmental and social impact for business is very important for me. I studied business at AUT and then I um, got really fascinated with a few concepts. One of them was called social entrepreneurship. And another one was called design thinking or systems thinking design. And um, I taught design thinking at AUT, that I was a lecturer. And with my students throughout the semester, I realized that we were trying to tackle issues or solve problems that were related to local government. Now, personally, because I grew up in a third world country, like in Colombia, I saw how important local government is to um, influence people in terms of every day, your roads, your parks, your footpaths, your businesses, everything is involved with local government. So I decided to stand when I was 27. I made it in. I was leading the local economic development portfolio. And then I restood again. And now I lead park, sports, and recreation, which, which is one of the biggest portfolios for the local board. It has the biggest budget and it has a huge amount of responsibility. And I'm um, seeing how World, the world is not really taking action in terms of their carbon emissions and um, you know how to be socially fair with people. I decided to join a party called the Opportunities Party and I stood and I'm standing for the seat of Epson against David Seymour. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Right, right. Thanks, Adriana, for that lovely, as I, as I always said to the viewers, that you are a multi-talented and now that you have gone into sports as well, so which is a big part of the human uh, survival and existence. So let's get straight into now the topics that I am interested in and would like to see your visions and how you put that in perspective. So um, the first and foremost question that I would like to have, with the pandemic, with the COVID-19 situation, which is one of those situations which we have, must, we have faced with viruses and different kinds of viruses before, but um, 
now that we have realized that it's uh, one of the hundred years kind of situation where like a war that we had to rebuild everything and it's a real crisis. So the first topic that I am uh, chosen and it's um, what is going to happen to the human rights in this crisis and how do we future proof and make sure that everybody, no matter what, where they come from, no matter what age they are in, their rights, their entitlement should not be disturbed or should not be, you know, um, whatever you would call it, like uh, that they're struggling for that. It shouldn't happen. So how do we future proof this, Adriana? Yeah. So it's really interesting because what we've seen with COVID is that people at the top, the 1%, are actually mm. struggling, you know, big corporates yes. used to make a lot of money and they've had to close their franchises, you know, yes. people have been fired who had really well paying jobs. So what we're mm. facing at the moment within Aotearoa is there's a lot of people that have high senior roles that have mm. had to um, apply for a redundancy because their corporates have shrunk. So I, um, what I've found is that people are now slightly more empathetic towards everyone else because mm -hmm. people that usually weren't empathetic because they didn't struggle now are mm -hmm. facing quite a few struggles financially, emotionally, mentally. So I feel that everyone kind of has understood that we're all human and no matter our cultural or ethnic back backgrounds or financial backgrounds, we're all struggling with the same issue, which is COVID. Mm -hmm. In terms of the human rights, um, I really do feel that a written constitution would be an ideal thing because mm -hmm. we don't have one. And right. if we have a written mm -hmm. constitution that states our democracy reset in terms of stating mm -hmm. what are our um, human rights written, you know, not what the UN says, it's what Aotearoa says, well, that, um, yeah, what yeah. is our um, equal rights as women, um, LGBTQIA plus, um, mm. also being able to take people outside of that welfare trap, you know, people that depend on um, a form of benefit have quite a lot of stigma behind it. You know, there's a lot of people on the top that talk really poorly about people that are trying mm. to make ends meet. So yeah. yeah, to be entirely honest, fundamentally and mo most tactically, if you are able to implement a new cons a written constitution, a formal document that states all your rights, then we would be better off. And obviously, given that COVID has hit all kinds of people from all races and all economic backgrounds, I feel that now, since we've had to reimagine ourselves, mm -hmm. we slightly are more empathetic towards some other people. So do you think uh, it's a need for the change for with the existing situation? Do you think that we should not be following just United Nations or just uh, overseas uh, dictatorship? We should have something for us, for as a, our, our own country, our own nation, that we could protect and we could future-proof that. Uh, yeah, well, um, hmm. well, this is very interesting because, you know, we tend to tell the world that Aotearoa is... Um, Kiwi ingenuity, number eight wire mm. mentality, innovators, you know, we're trying to like set the norm. So yeah. if we take the initiative and if yeah. we actually are leading in ways of like setting set standards that our country should run as and it's beneficial and we can collect data that shows that it is working, then mm. why wouldn't we be able to influence these big dictator organizations like the UN instead of um, waiting for them to tell us what to do? Yeah, no, I 100% uh, agree in that situation that this is our problem. This is our issues with our background, with our environmental and geographical demographic that we are in. And uh, it, it is time that we should take the stock with ourselves and our government really should be focusing on that changing or twigging or editing things that can benefit us as a nation. I 100% agree. And well, that was great. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. That's a great perspective. And that's a great positive approach as well, because we are not then just getting into what we are already having issues. So no, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, for that. you know, what's really interesting is that us as a society, we've been told by our parents not to 
bash against the walls or not to get into too much trouble. But, mm. you know, funny enough, that's led us directly into trouble. And we've got housing, economic, biodiversity, agriculture, yeah. Yeah. water crisis. Mm. So it's time for us to take action and the that's initiative right. to start changing, right? Mm. Absolutely. Agree. Absolutely, Adriana. That's great. Okay. Let's go to the second topic, which is what I have got, is the crisis on child poverty. We have seen that the numbers of kids, what we before it was when this government came or any government was there before. First and foremost, there was an issue. The acknowledgement was done in the last few years, probably. And that's the first, my fundamental question to you is, um, there was a crisis called child poverty, but it was never acknowledged. It was never highlighted in the light the way it is now. So from that point of view, I wanted to see your perspective and your visions that how do you future proof this child poverty crisis in the coming days, not just months and years, in the coming days, which is a high priority, according to me. But what do you think? I fully agree. You know, so we all know because evidence has shown us that child poverty is driven by income inequality, by mm -hmm. housing unaffordability, by lack of food in your tummy, a lack of a stable household. And also, mm -hmm. you know, so what tends to happen is that kids who don't have breakfast in the mornings, who don't have their lunches packed up, whose parents are working three to four jobs trying to pay for their mm. rent, who they are tired, they don't mm. learn, they don't have a strong mental health because they're trying to be resilient with the current situations that they're facing. So yeah. first and foremost, you know, we need to really get behind organizations, charitable organizations that are currently doing the work. Mm. You know, they're out there in the community. You know, it's great that the government is now acknowledging that we need to tackle child poverty, but that's yeah. a policy level, am I right? So there yeah. is all these organizations that teach kids about urban regeneration, their relationship with food, environmental stuff, have um, an ability to be able to make them feel like they're a part of a community. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, but it all happens and it all is driven by the family's income. So if mm -hmm. we are able to take people away from their welfare trap, either mm -hmm. by implementing a GMI, a UBI, restructuring the welfare system, then these kids who are trapped in poverty will be able to have a safe dry home to live in, be able to have proper food or learn about growing food and feed themselves and also are able to express themselves because being able to let kids to be curious, to enjoy playgrounds, to look around and to like absorb things in uh, libraries, for example, or sports complexes that all helps them to thrive and have a better life in the long run. So it's not about just uh, breakfast or lunches, but also recreational, educational. That's what you think also would really definitely add on value and help the kids in a proper frame of mind, right? That's what I get the point. Mm. Okay, so you said about, you touched about the char charitable trusts and charities that are doing already in community work into a great and to a larger extent. How do you future proof these things where it is working or it is has to work 100% in terms of, you know, that we have seen these charities existed before as well. These um, services existed before acknowledging of child poverty as well. But the numbers have gone up. And with COVID-19, the numbers have just shoot up. So how do we now future proof all the services that are doing this great work is really monitored or is really future proof that yes, it is working and the numbers come down and not increase. What will be your vision in that regard? How do you like well, we that? have to look at evidence, what's happened and um, you know, what a main driver of inequality and you know, a main driver of the housing crisis, which leads to child poverty is that incomes have been going at this rate 
and houses and rents have been going at that rate. Yeah. So there's a huge disparity since 1990 of yeah. the opportunities of people to be able to afford their own homes and have a better quality of life. Mm. So that if that specific issue is tackled, mm -hmm. I can guarantee that you will be able to future proof things. Now, funny that you talk about charities. My grandparents left New Zealand to South America to start up a charity that help thousands of kids in, in Colombia, South America, who are on the street. So the poverty there is ginormous. Like we have quite a lot of poverty here in New Zealand, but mm. there's not even benefits over there. You can't live off a benefit. You are a recycler and you pick up trash and you live mm. in a slum. And, yeah. um, you know, charities are good for interim stuff. They're a band-aid effect. They are able to maybe the likes of eat my lunch to be able to feed kids from schools. You know, all of those things are good, well and done. But if we don't tackle the fundamental part of it, then, yeah. you know, it will be, it won't, it won't fix. It will keep on getting worse. Charities will keep on working hard. Budgets mm. will keep on being cut. And then people still will be earning very little income compared to the price of the houses that they live in. So that's yeah. it's it's proven evidence has shown that a big driver of housing inequality or housing crisis here in Aotearoa is inequality and unaffordability and mm -hmm. that's part of poverty yeah i'll come to that uh, when we come to that other topic and it's it's very powerful what you said is inequality and affordability and these are the two major major stumps that uh, every government or any party or anyone who comes in power to look into that straight away. So I'll come to that, but that's good insight that you said about the, ch the charities that are existing and then how we can future proof all of that. Uh, so yeah, no, I appreciate that answer was, uh, was really good, good insight. And I think being you in the community, I know you have been in the local board. This is where the first hand information you get from the communities that what the people are struggling and why they are struggling and where they are struggling, you know? And so I really take your point on that inequality, affordability and uh, house prices, the businesses and all of that. Um, so that's really makes sense. Um, so yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, let's go to another, another important topic that I have got. So, this is all quite related because this is what we are talking about is uh, when we said human rights and then we said child poverty, but then the third comes is the essentials, which is not just the doctors, nurses, or the GPs, or the firemen or the policemen or all the government services that we have, but essentials also are the farmers. And I really, during COVID-19 for me, I thought that, okay, what would happen if the farmers were having issues and we don't have a product producers, we don't have food producers, we would be more relying on imports. But then how do we future proof? We understand people say, oh, they are all scattered, the land is not together and all of that. But crisis like COVID-19 doesn't give a warning and come. Crisis like this can come in any shape or form, and that can hit farmers at that time and may not hit others. So anything can happen. And so I am intrigued to ask you this question about the farmers future proofing, because these are our life and blood of the food producers. So can you throw some light on that, which what will be your view on it? I love that we're talking about this because, you know, we all need a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher. Well, maybe not mm. a teacher. Teachers are quite important. But mm. a politician, we all use them every once in a while. We yeah. benefit from farmers more than three times a day. It's what we eat, right? Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, unfortunately, here in New Zealand, we've valued our land so, so, so much that farmers mm. struggle to make a profit out of what they produce off the land. Mm. So it, it's, it, we're facing a really interesting scenario because New Zealand in terms of farming sustainability practices is way beyond any other country in the world in terms of meat production, dairy production and farms. Now I can break them into a few points. So the first one is um, stop urban sprawling. 
So mm -hmm. what happens in local government is that the city is growing a lot and it isn't growing up, it's growing to the sides. And mm -hmm. especially here in Tamaki Makoto, what we're facing is that there's all these developments that are planning to take mm -hmm. over agricultural land. Mm. And we need to find a way to stop it. We need to make sure that all of us understand that city density, meaning if you grow mm -hmm. up like right behind yeah. me, instead of growing yeah. across, then you're be, yeah. you'll be able to walk to your place of work. You'll be able to enjoy the park that's right next to your apartment. You'll be able to walk to school in that. So that's a main issue is starting to protect the land that gives agricultural mm -hmm. land. Farmers at the moment are facing a uh, huge financial stress due mm -hmm. to COVID, due to living in such an expensive land that they sell their land. You know, and we need to incentivize them to keep their land and we need to incentivize them to keep producing their land because in terms of climate change, in terms of being mm -hmm. able to save the climate, if all yeah. of us were able to grow our own food, compost, mm -hmm. we would be mm -hmm. all collectively sequestering carbon that's going out into the environment, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a huge issue. Um, another big issue is our soil regeneration. So a lot of our soil is not fit for purpose in terms of growing. And it's because what we've done in the past is that we haven't been smart about our growing. There's heaps of documentaries in Netflix these days that explain the importance of caring for the land, of growing yeah. a permaculture. That's a beautiful mm -hmm. aspect of things. So, um, you know, farmers are important pollinators are important the bees the mm -hmm. butterflies the birds protecting them creating areas where they can grow what we face here specifically in tamaki makoto is that we have our farming land within our city you know mm -hmm. pukakoi is within our city and you know we need to make sure that we create an environment for all these pollinators to thrive around our city also mm -hmm. Urban regeneration and urban agriculture is really important as well. There's a lot of people that have left their farms and have moved into the city. And this isn't only seen here in Aotearoa, it's seen all around the world. You know, I read an article this morning of coffee growers in Ethiopia and in Colombia are struggling because their following generation don't mm. value the land because they've been taught that it's good to have a suit, to be in a corporate office, to manage some trust funds or some money. It's really important that we start creating a um, kind of like a, a reward for the farmers, that we respect them, that we love them because these farmers are what keeps us thriving. You know, all, everything that we grow is what gives mm. us oxygen. Um, yeah. Another thing is that, so there's been some regulations within government that mm -hmm. kind of have limited the export of, um, you know, high produce items, let's say fruit, let's say meat, let's say milk. And what's happened is that that middleman has been able to put pressure on the farmers because the farmers want to export. That's where the money is, right? But then the middleman pays very little to the farmers for the produce that they create. So they're mm. struggling right now because they need to export their goods because they're high quality, mm. because the likes of Japan and Switzerland and China really want them, but mm -hmm. they can't generate that much revenue themselves. Hence, they mm. sell their land. So it's those three aspects that I really feel that we need to start um, tackling. Yeah. I think funny you said that because I, I did uh, research a little bit. You are also a strong advocate for environment, isn't it? And that's probably why you are more insights on how the farming really should be tackled or should be handled with not just uh, producers or the farmers, but also the soil, the earth, the environmental and the urban area and the rural areas and all those, which is really, really good insight because and I believe that this is what we need a knowledge of uh, how we future proof farming. It's not about just putting policies or giving some sort of boundaries or setting some boundaries, but actually recognizing the need, recognizing the environmental issues, recognizing the geographical 
issues and the demographic that we are in. So I really love that. Uh, and I just realized that you have been also quite uh, advocate for the environmental things. And uh, I've seen that, which is also you have one of those portfolios handled in your career. And being a social enterprise and everything that you have already into that, uh, it's really good to see that insight. I really am happy with that answer that somebody came up and said that, okay, yes, this is what you had to divide with the farmers um, and how you future-proof farmers. And you rightly said they work day in and day out to feed us and we need them 24 hours. It's like we can't be just without them. Nothing happens really. So great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adriana. Um, now we go to my favorite part. So I'm going to ask you also, because I have seen that you are not just a lecturer, but an environmentalist, but also a social entrepreneur, and you understand business because I believe you are also in business and you, um, you are also all about advocate for implementing sustainable business practices. Am I right? So, um, and that probably why has happened. So let me talk about the SME or the small entrepreneurs. You touched before about the corporates, businesses who are not doing well and who have to franchises them going down because they cannot sustain. You talked about them before. What what will be your vision for the SMEs, the small entrepreneurs, which is the major part of New Zealand, which is the 90, 95% part of it. And 70%, I believe, are part of all the self-employed, which they in and they thrive, thrive for their day-to-day -day business. So with the economic crisis like this in the business and with you being a progressive, you know, practices that you believe in implementing for businesses, Tell us more about business because this is fascinating for me also to understand and I can relay that and all most of the viewers would be loving to hear who are in this self-employment mode and who are also in the SMEs sector. Um, it's actually really topical because I just presented to a business association about being able to create low carbon outcomes for their businesses that are um, cheap you know, that, and they're extremely effective. So it's funny because I was just talking about that. Now, wow. business is very diverse and there's multiple different types of industries, right? So mm -hmm. uh, for small businesses specifically, something that is really important, and I learned this around about eight years ago, is that you may be really good at creating mm. your product, but mm. you definitely need help being able to sell it, Absolutely. being able yeah. to administer it, being able to calculate the money. So, you yes. know, what is um, something that I advocate for quite a lot is that the government gives or government gives small business enterprises a budget for them to be able to help their digital platforms. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> and what happens with these is that, you know, you get given a grant. Mm -hmm. That grant is specifically made for digital support and admin support. So being able to okay. quantify your key performance indicators and knowing how to do that, being able to do your cost of good analysis in terms of your suppliers, your petrol and all of that, and also being able to forecast your profit and loss. Any small business, you know, I'm very fortunate that I studied business and this is yeah. basically my bread and butter. But when I talk yeah. to small businesses around, some people, when they start, they don't really understand the importance of being able to cost out their labor, to yeah. cost out their supplies, to understand that you need to save some money for a rainy yeah. day. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, a, a really interesting aspect about this is that if we are able to encourage businesses to aim to be low carbon as well as um, being able to educate themselves, then in the future, we'll have businesses that aren't harmful for the environment, but quite the opposite. They're key drivers of protecting the environment. And that's something that I'm really wanting to advocate for. Small business is the backbone of our economy in Aotearoa, you know, and we do need to acknowledge that 
you know, small businesses don't last more than five years. And this isn't all a bad thing. Sometimes it could be a positive thing because once you put your shop there and set everything up and things didn't really work out, then you can learn from your findings and be able to identify what does actually work. So in terms of development, it's really important and I don't see it happening here. And I really wish I could actually um, encourage the likes of AT to be working with the yeah. development sector of Auckland Council because mm -hmm. a train station, for example, in Mount Eden, yeah. there is a room for retailers to move in there, right? But mm -hmm. what is the key needs of Eden Terrace in Mount Eden? There is no local deli or supermarket. There, the yeah. pharmacy is quite far away. I used to live um, there, so I'm quite well aware of the situation there. Sure. You know, the, the, there is no playground for the early mm -hmm. childhood centers, which are private childhood centers. So if you're mm -hmm. tactically being able to create these areas that mm -hmm. come and house local supermarkets, come mm -hmm. and house local retailers, um, and then be able to create an area for the community, say a Plunkett, say a toy library, say a playground, say a little library, um, then you'll be able to influence it in terms of being tactical of how you want to create that area and also support the businesses that will be there. Because what you've done is that you've analyzed the demographics of the area so let's mm -hmm. say, for example, the likes of Eden Terrace and Mount Eden have a lot of families because it's a grammar zone, mm -hmm. you know, so there's a lot of people that work hard to get their kids in those main big seven schools, then what are their needs? They need somewhere that they can get like locally sourced clothes for their families, food for their kids, ideally organic, ideally fair trade, ideally lo locally sourced, you know, mm -hmm. pharmacies, doctors, you know, so if you're able to analyze your demographic, identify their needs, identify their pain points of what needs to be solved, and yeah. then allow those specific businesses to thrive there, then we can guarantee their longevity because people will need them. And True. this is what tends to happen a lot. Retailers come in, they see a cheap shop, mm. they put it in, but they don't actually know the demographics. Mm. Yeah. But in terms of like what, uh, in terms of sustainability with this during COVID-19 and this situation that we are in for small businesses has hit hard. And in, with this view in point, what do you think the small businesses for future proofing them or making them comfortable or sustainable as you, um, what really we need to take major actions? Like for example, I've got a question with the existing cost of uh, commercial lease or rent uh, for the businesses, that's one of the major costs now, they are feeling the pinch because now they had no business and they can't afford the cost. So do you think there should be a change or some approach to change the existing cost so that these businesses can come up or sustain? Because that's one of the major things as a business advisor I have seen. Um, that's one of the major uh, things I've seen that people say that, okay, we can't afford the cost of the fixed cost, which was pre-COVID was okay. But now we are in a situation we have to come up. The businesses first have to sustain. So how do you draw, uh, like, a, do you think there should be a change? Do you think we need to change, look at the existing costs for these businesses? That, because otherwise yes, the support most that definitely. government is so, doing. You know what's really interesting is that the main reason why um, rent is so expensive for businesses is the same reason that we have housing unaffordability. Mm -hmm. It's the same diagram. So your income has been going like that and the price of land has been going like that for farmers, for small businesses, and for your household owners. You know, mm -hmm. so if you're able to balance that disparity of income and rent, then even commercial leases wouldn't have to sell their soul and sign up. And that's another thing. It's like, there's, I was just walking down K Road in Ponsonby. There's so many closed shops, right? Because for a landlord, you know, in the current system, you need a retailer that can be there for at least a year, right? What right. if we allow 
um, at the moment, allow pop-ups, allow artists mm -hmm. to take over, allow local businesses who can't really afford the rent, but if mm -hmm. they share with each mm -hmm. other and they work in collaboration, they're able to do it, right? So yes, mm -hmm. there is a huge issue with being able to be a retailer and to have a shop front within Aotearoa. Mm -hmm. You have to have a lot of money. You have to generate mm -hmm. a lot of revenue. So and that, that's really important that the price of land needs to stop for a while so that income can catch up because that is also driving a huge issue for small businesses. Absolutely. So that's why the businesses are closing down or they can't afford. So they say that either they will operate from home if they are or from online if they are. But people who have to operate through commercial, then they have to operate through commercial. And that rent is an existing rent, which is quite high. So even if there is a support from the government or from any agencies, it's going towards the existing cost that is not changed and that is not going to change. So if that is not going to change, how are these businesses going to come up is the question. And it's not going to benefit them. Even the support that they get now is not benefiting them. It's actually going towards the cost of the existing area that they have to, to survive. So do you think there should be a, some change in this kind of uh, approach or different approach should be seen to handle this situation? This is a really tough situation because this means that all of us have a very important sacrifice Correct. to make. Yeah, that's what you I know. Mean. And, you know, I've been reading a lot of economic papers because of me being um, a, a candidate. And, you know, at the moment, what happens is that we need to start treating housing and land as the same way that we treat any other productive economy, you know? So what does that mean? That we unfortunately need to implement some form of tax because what happens is that once we implement that here in the next 10 years, businesses will be thriving longer because they won't be having to pay that much rent. Why? Because what you're doing is that you're encouraging businesses or landowners that have multiple pieces of land to mm. actually sell them or make them productive. Mm. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of people, like all these empty shops that are happening down here in Cave Road, Correct. most of them are one landlord. Yeah, yeah, that's, right? that's exactly what. So and the... it's like, if you're not doing anything with that empty shop, sell it, mate. Mm. You know, and, and help us change and move the economy. Because you sitting there, because mm. you're wanting to wait until the price of your land to goes up yeah, to sell it, yeah. is ridiculous. This is why we're in this problem since the beginning. Yeah, that's why I was asking you this, because you know this firsthand. And uh, now is the need for a change, not at a later. Otherwise, this will more delay to come up. The businesses will have more delaying in coming up themselves and they, they will be more depending on government benefits or government support. But if you want to come out of that, these are the existing issues that needs to be looked at straight away. And there has to be, do you think there should be some like a, like foreign buyers regulation they bought in, right? Not to buy. What about these internal regulations for people holding 100 properties or 50 properties or 20 properties? Why can't there be a regulation on that? So essentially what happens, the regulation or the, the, the proposal that I'm supporting for government is that yeah. you tax 1% of equity times 33% mm. of the proposed tax that the Opportunities Party is putting sure. forward. Now, I'm not selling the party right now. I'm just selling a model, a financial model that has proven around the mm. world to work. And um, so what tends to happen is that once you pay let's say for example if you have on equity three hundred thousand mm. dollars per year you would only be paying two thousand nine hundred dollars tax mm -hmm. but what tends to happen which isn't much if we think about it which isn't much it isn't yeah, a yeah. huge amount of money it's pretty similar to what you're paying in terms of your rates but yeah. this incentive if you don't want to pay that amount of money then sell your property you know, mm. and, and, and and Correct. wait, right? Sorry, Correct. I, I agree you. with you. But no, I agree with, with that. 
but how, what do you think like then what should happen now as a policy should we have some immediate policies to come for these things well we definitely need to implement a housing tax that's the main policy and it isn't housing for all households it's for yeah. land so you do support capital gain tax then i'm personally like as a person i understand the concept of the of the capital gains tax mm. i find it very um positive you know mm. but i do yeah. know so i i'm not really wanting to get involved with capital gains tax we're trying we're trying to shift it in terms of sure, an equity sure. tax but there has to be some sort of regulation in terms of people holding the properties for so much. If you have multiple it. properties and you're making money yeah. out of it, then you should pay. Yeah. Yeah. It's like right. any other business. Yeah, I agree with that concept because that's what I've been finding that, okay, one, as you rightly said, that one person owning so many properties, commercial, and then renting out to businesses and the businesses are not able to afford to pay. And if, even if they are afford to, they are afford to at the cost of the government supporting them and then they are paying back to them. So it's still making the richer richer. Still it's like the person who is already having, is getting easy money from the government indirectly through the businesses, which is, which is crazy. Yeah, so that's, um, I'm this really- This is what I feel. This is my opinion. Like in my opinion, like this needs to be handled. And now, what do you think? What's your vision for the small it's business? It's urgent. It's very yeah. urgent. It's as important as stop your carbon emissions. It's as important as tackling child poverty. To be entirely honest, if that is mm -hmm. tackled, I can guarantee the level of poverty in New Zealand would definitely shrink. Mm. Yeah, so it's a, it has got a multiple good effects, isn't it? Positive effects. It's a fundamental change, you know, it's part of the main pillars of the economy. Right, 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 right. Now that's, that's I totally, totally understand. I get that. So it's, it's uh, good. So in terms of small businesses, like, do you, what's your vision in terms of now since COVID-19? Because this is a topic where, most of the businesses also would like to get into businesses. The other question I have with the businesses is the training. And you, because I know you have been into that space of, um, of your own business with training and learning and then creating your own, like a niche product and market. So I've heard that recently the government has put some lot of efforts on training and retraining for people. But in terms of trades, in terms of carpentry and all that trades, but what about professionals like lawyers and accountants who are out of job or people, mortgage brokers and those kind of professionals who will be out of job because of the business is not there. What do you think should happen something for that? What's your vision if you are in that position? Of a professional. Well, it's quite tricky, you know, because like <laughs> I'm trying my best to not be political and I'm trying my best to be. No, 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 not political. But, um, it's your yeah, vision so, of uh, professionals. Yeah, well, you know, this is, we need to start either upskilling ourselves or diversifying our skills, you know. Yeah. Um, mm. I realize because, you know, my parents don't live here and I had to mm. sustain myself since I was mm. 17 when I moved over. Um, yeah what tends to happen is that I have multiple skills, right? I've done yeah. bartending, I'm a swimming coach, yes. I'm a carpenter, I'm a politician, you know, I do facilitations, I lecture, you know, I, I feel that, you know, if we all start understanding that we can't have one specific, you know, we might be passionate about multiple things, but we need to upskill mm -hmm. ourselves. And this is why, yeah. you know, the mm -hmm. concept of the universal basic income for me is fascinating, mm -hmm. especially for young entrepreneurs or aspiring right. entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Because then what happens is that if the Pallet Kingdom, when I was starting it, I was making $250 a week, I would mm -hmm. have been able to invest way more time into the admin side of my business, you mm -hmm. know? And I wouldn't have put such a financial strain on myself as well, because yeah. I have been living by selling table by table, chair by chair. And when I yes, can't sell, yes. I'm struggling, you know, mm -hmm. and then I have to diversify myself and find other ways of being able to work. So, um, hello. 
no, I thought I lost yeah. you there for a second. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's uh, an aspect that if you are able to upskill yourself, because we don't invest in people, we invest mm. in business. We So yeah. this is, this is a double sided thing because it's like, for example, since we are, and we tell the world that we're innovators, then mm. we need to start investing in research and development. And, you yeah. know, um, you know, there's, Parties like Action National that want to cut the budgets of the likes of Callahan Innovation, which are incubators, which yeah. are there to help businesses become more niche, become more innovative, become more world leading. And so if we're able to one, support the entrepreneur or the aspiring entrepreneur with mm. a form of safety net, which is just a very small amount of money, 250 a week, but also mm. if we're able to generate a landing pad where these businesses can develop, can get mm -hmm. experts to support them, then by all means, why not? Yeah, yeah. No, I understand. But what about directly going benefit to the people who are innovative? I understand that when organizations like Callahan Foundation and all that innovation, um, Ice House and all that are there. But what about if people wants to go directly benefit to the people uh, who well, are Well, that's why business, so actually I'm currently in K Road because I had a meeting in Palm Springs, so I'm walking on my way walking home. Um, okay. So what I see is that there's business associations and K Road is a perfect example. K Road has taken the initiative of creating mm. low economic outcomes for mm. their businesses and helping them become more resilient. You know, yes. and, 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 and what they've done here at the moment, especially with the development of the cycling lane and everything, they've been able to go business by business, offer mm. a digital package of, let me help yeah. you with your website. Let me help you with your business. Let me help you with your suppliers. Do you need mm. to share rubbish with the business next to you so that your costs mm. go down? Do you yeah. need to bring in a recycling bin so that your costs go down? Should we all mm. collectively restaurants do compost and yeah. that reduces our waste by 35%? That's less money that mm. we have to pay. So, mm. um, you know, if we keep on encouraging business associations to not do yeah. business as usual, but to take the initiative yeah. to train their current retailers, mm -hmm. then things are mm -hmm. better off. Yeah, no, well said, well said. I think we have to come together as all business associations, all the agencies, all the organizations to really work towards helping and supporting all the small to medium or to self-employed people. That's the message that I see what you are trying to put across, right? That's yeah, great. that's right. That's, that's right. Great. That's great. Thank you. I understand you much better now. <laughs> yeah. Your no, that's good. Okay. Let's go to the last question is the about the age care crisis. What we have seen during the COVID-19 is we were just all focusing and we would like, we wanted to everyone to focus more because of the advice from the overseas or from the World Health Organizations that age old population needs to be looked after. But don't you think in general, anyway, age old should be looked after at any given point of time? Not Definitely. Yeah. Um, I really do think that prevention is key when it comes to health. Yeah. So if you have since a young age, your understanding with your food, if you yeah. understand the importance of your mental health, mm. if, so if you understand the importance of not eating that much sugar, mm. then we wouldn't be facing all the non-communicable diseases that we are currently facing as a society. Am yeah. I right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, we could prevent diabetes, we could prevent gout, we could prevent mm -hmm. a lot of mental health issues if we focus on making sure that we create a prevention in terms of understand education. Education mm -hmm. is really hard. I get it mm -hmm. takes a lot of investment, but our education hasn't really changed in the past hundred years. Mm -hmm. So yes. we need to start um, finding ways of being able to mm -hmm. teach people the importance of eating organic, the importance of having a balanced diet, the importance of exercising, you know, for mm. your mental and, and, and physical well-being. Um, yeah. That's really important. Also, you know, the, the care that we give our elderly, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the, the, it isn't just what, it isn't just giving them a retirement home. 
and Correct. making sure that they have enough yeah. food. It's creating that sense of community. You know, yeah, intergenerational relationships are key. Mm. And we don't mm. see that. I'm very sad yeah. to see so many people my age that have yeah. so much disgust towards the boomers or towards the senior citizens when yes. not we shouldn't really do that. We should learn from their mistakes, of course, but we should mm. get them on board with our transition. Does that yes. make sense? Yeah, I hundred percent. I hundred percent. I was about to say that because you are absolutely spot on when you say that we don't involve and we do look at the age-old population as something sidelined. They have been sidelined as if they are they don't exist. That's how we have treated, and this is not really good. Oh, you! I lost you, Adriana. I'm listening. Hello. Okay, so this is something. Um, that I was also wanting to see that what more can be done in terms of the age care, not just the rest homes, but what are the other recreational or engagement facilities that we could provide, that we could make them feel a part of the current generation community and not just leave them as a non-existent generation. I love this question. So I am fascinated with this concept, which is called the 880s cities. Mm -hmm. So if you create a city that is made for an eight year old and an 80 year old, then you've created a fully inclusive city. And what do mm. eight year olds want? They want to go to the library. They want to go to their swimming pool. They want to go to a park. They want to walk to their friends safely. You know, they mm. want to be able to mm. play um, with yeah. nature. They're, they're, they're wanting to be able to be curious and explore. You know, what do 80 year olds want to do? They want to walk to their grandkids. They want to yeah. go to the library. They want to take their grandkids to the park. Mm. They want to take their grandkids to go and do swimming or play any other yeah. sport. Mm. So if we're focused on developing a city that mm. is tailored to protect mm. our urban spaces, you know, Newmarket is a perfect example. There's so many schools around Newmarket and Epsom and Mount Eden, right? Mm. We don't have a facility that houses all these people. Mm, we don't have mm. a facility, a, play, a, a basketball court. We don't have a skating rink. We don't have a playground. We mm. don't have a library. Mm. What happens? They're all at time zone playing mm. on their pokey machines or they're um, doing naughty things in the station square where the train, yeah. train station yeah. is. So you need to use that energy and funnel it through activities. I really so that's something love it. I'm currently working on, but it's, it's pretty complicated when... You know, you don't well, have that much money. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you said very well, like eight-year-old and eight-year-old. It's a great concept because this is exactly what the eight-year-old wants to do when they are eight-year-old. They want to move their legs and hands and eyes and okay. the environment. They want to be in the yeah. community. They want Can I say move. something really interesting about this? Is that sure. mm. as a city, you know, we're talking about all the needs that we have as people. But... Yeah. We don't have the finances to do this. So um, any development that Auckland does, 40% mm -hmm. of that money goes straight to central government. And what mm -hmm. happens? Only 7% of the revenue that is created in the city with new developments goes back into local government. Really? We have a backlog and mm. lack of so much infrastructure, water quality, um, public transport, schooling, because we don't have enough money to solve all of these. So we really need to analyze what are we going to do with the GST that is produced in new developments in the city? You know, I propose that we ring fence it and that we replug it into central government, I mean, local government, because if we are able to ring fence the GST that is produced in the city, put it back into local government so that local councils can do the development of more sports facilities, more schools, more and improved um, abilities of doing transport, then things will be better off. But it's really hard to say all of these needs without, you know, highlighting the obvious, which is we don't really That's have the money to do it at the moment. So do you think the when you said that you don't have the money, but you said that generation money goes majorly to the central government. So do you think that it is a money generation issue or is it a redistribution issue or is it a priority issue? What would you call this? Um, primarily redistribution because yeah. money will come, you know, developments yes. will come, right. investors will come. 
You know, mm-hmm. once you make things attractive and beautiful, people will be there and they'll put money for it. It's yes. like I said, if you're able to ring fence the GST of new developments that are produced within the city and mm-hmm. reinvest them into local needs, then mm-hmm. we will be better off. Now, this isn't a new idea. Local government New Zealand has been trying to propose this for a few years now. And central yeah. government, you mm-hmm. know, and um, the leader of my party says something that is quite harsh, but it's true. Central mm-hmm. government won't give more money to local government because the politicians in the Beehive want to be the ones cutting the ribbons. Mm-hmm. Want to be the yeah. people taking the, 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 the pride of, oh, yeah, I did that. Yes. You know, we need to change that. That Absolutely. is not getting us anywhere. Absolutely, 100% agree. And that's what uh, I was wanting to ask you as well in terms of the, we don't, we are not here just as a statue or just as a, you know, people who want to pretend to be who we are not. We are here to make a difference. And to make a difference, we have to show that level of, you know, um, resilience, but also change in attitude. Okay, that's how it is. I think your phone is about to die. Okay. I can't hear you. You're on mute. I was just about to say that. But do you know what? I feel so happy talking to you and saying that you agree with what I'm saying because it isn't a political thing. It's being able to bring solutions to the table because we all love to complain. But who is actually giving the solutions? We need to start the dialogue now. So, yeah, no, I really appreciate I wanted to talk more about the health as well. uh, But your phone is probably is going to die. So I might have another session with you to discuss on health and other things that I would love to about your career. I would love, love to be able to talk to you again. I apologize. I'm in between meetings and... I and also because I think your camera was you are more on that side. So maybe uh, next time when we do, we do a little bit better. But I'll, I'll produce this video and I'll send it to you as well, just for your sake and my sake as well. But let's tee up another time and get, uh, get some other topics going with this. I love your vision. And as I always said, like you are a multi-talented, a multi-faceted person, multi-skilled, which you can bring a lot to the table and uh, make awareness and positive change. And you being very progressive. So I really appreciate your time, Adriana. And it's a real pleasure to interview you or to have a Thank you so with. much. I do apologize about the camera. Um, but yeah. hey, here I am out in the community doing the things. Here's yes. proof of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so best of luck for your future endeavors. And I know the election is on the card and uh, I really uh, wish you well. And also, if you win, I would like to see more and more. But even the whether win or lose is just a title, but you're making a difference is what you are. Thank you. And that's Bless why you. I would love to uh, have a conversation once again with you. Thank you so Bless much. You. Bless you. Bless, Bless you. You have a fantastic day. And I guess for all the viewers that see this as well, and a little encouragement for everyone to do some compost. (laughs) Take care. Yes, thank you very much, Adriana. Yes. See ya. Bye. Bye.